So this is our last in the series, uh, Carols About Jesus. And what we have been doing is we have been using uh, four different, well, today's the fourth, prior to this, three different Christmas carols to learn more about Jesus. Because each of these carols that we have looked at points us to Christ, and, sh- and each of them are inspired by Scripture. And so these are not really sermons expounding on the hymn as much as allowing the hymn to direct us uh, to Jesus in the Bible. And so we've done that for three weeks, and this is the last one. Now, carol is a song, a hymn in praise of God. A uh, second definition of a carol is just singing or saying something happily, uh, which describes Christmas songs quite well. Uh, the one we're doing today is called Angels We Have Heard on High. Now, here's what you don't know. Every song that we just sang was about worship. It was not just that every song was worship, and worship is giving worth to God, but every song that we sang was just now, what we've just been doing for the last 30 minutes, has been singing songs about worship. The first song that we sang called on all of creation to praise and to worship God. The second song that we sang called on you and I as Christians to praise and worship God. The third song that we sang was this one, which we're going to see is actually about worship, which we'll look at in a minute. And then as we were singing a holy night, it is a call to you to worship Jesus. Every single one of those songs was about worship. And that's actually what this song was about. Now, I have a confession to make. I didn't know that. Like before I started working on this sermon, I didn't know that this song was actually about worship. But it, it really is. First, let me tell you about the guy who wrote it. Uh, this is a guy named, this is James Chadwick. Uh, and James, this is the only, I've, my son Joel is doing screens today. He had to go hunt for the picture for me. He said this is the only picture in existence. Like there are no others. So if you don't like this one, too bad, because there are no other pictures of James Chadwick. But James Chad- Chadwick was a Roman Catholic priest. Uh, he, was, uh, he was English and Irish, born in Ireland in 1813, died in 1882. Now, he wrote this song in 1862. That's why we have an old po- photograph of him, because it was in the 1800s, but obviously not many. Uh, but... Uh, he wrote this song. It's, I'm saying he wrote it. I keep saying he wrote it. It's sort of a translation. We don't know who wrote the original. It's anonymous. It was a song that had been around for a little while. It was written in French originally. Whoever wrote the song in French, good songwriter, we don't know who they are. But what James Chadwick did was when he found this, this French carol, he translated it into English. But it's a loose translation. So it's not, it's not a literal translation. It's not a word-for-word word translation. And sometimes he goes, yeah, I'm going to change that and make it better. So this is an, it, it, though it, it's a translation, it's inspired by another song that follows, that follows it. It's also his own work, if that makes sense. It's, it's a translation slash inspiration. And so he, get, he gets credit for both translating and for writing uh, this song. And so uh, we're going to look at the English version because that's the one that we, that we sing. And so I'm going to show you the words and show you something in this song maybe you haven't noticed before. Now, for those of you, I tell you that as I walk you through this song, and, and a whole bunch of you go, well, I already knew that. Tell me later. And I'll be like, you are so smart. Uh, because I hadn't, I've been singing this song my entire life, and there's some things here I hadn't noticed. So we're going to put the first verse up there. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains. And the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. Okay, so, now think about what's happening here. Who's speaking? Like, who's talking? Is it you and me? Because we don't literally hear them, right? Is it you and I? Or is it the shepherd speaking here? Who's talking? If it's you and I, then what we're being called on to do is to use our imaginations for a holy purpose. And we're being called on to imagine what it would be like to hear the angels. Now, the Bible doesn't actually say in Luke chapter 2 that the angels sang glory to God in the highest. It says that they said it. Now, it's possible they did sing. 
They may have been singing it. The Bible just says said, which means it could have been spoken, it could have been chanted, could have been shouted, or it could have been sung. We don't really know. But here, here the picture is, angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing over the plain. So, so either you and I are using our imaginations and picturing what it was like to be standing there with the shepherds, hearing the angels say, glory to God in the highest, or the angels are talking to us in the story, right? And the angels are telling us 2,000 years later, hey, we heard the angels. And the mountains in reply, echoing the joyous strains. Now we know we're going to imagination, because it's not as though the mountains were literally making noise, right? But, and we don't know if there was actually an echo. But we are called on to use our imaginations, sanctified by scripture, to imagine creation praising God. Because the Bible actually says that. The stars and the hills and the mountains and everything that, that God has made gives worth to him. All of his creation gives worship to God. And so this is describing that. So we have the angels, right, heavenly beings who are singing praise to God, and we have creation. So we have a parallel here I want you to see. There's, a hev there's heaven praising God, right, heavenly beings, and there's earth praising God. So the heavens and the earth are praising God. The heavenly beings, the angels are praising God, and the earth that God has made is praying God, echoing back what they say, Gloria in excelsis Deo. Now, what does that mean? That is a Latin term, a Latin phrase that means glory to God in the highest. Now, English, we're weird. Our word order is all wrong. We're like different than every other language. Uh, but so literally, this is glory, glory in the highest to God. So God is the last word there, Deo. So Gloria in excelsis Deo is a Latin phrase. It was in the original French and so uh, when James Chadwick wrote this, he used the Latin and, and put it in the English version as well. Glory to God in the highest is what you're saying. And you're saying this is what the angels are saying. Glory to God in the highest. And the, and the mountains are echoing it. We can, all of creation is hearing this and echoing it back in praise of God in the highest. In the highest heavens. So heavenly creatures are, pra are praising God. The mountains are echoing it back. And so they're also praising God, heaven and earth. And who is being praised? God is in the highest heaven. So from heaven to earth and back again, God is being praised. Okay, let's look at the next verse. Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why are joyous strains prolonged? So... Again, who was speaking in the first verse? Was it us? Possibly. If it's us, the singer's doing it, and we're just using our imagination, angels we have heard on high, so we're just thinking about it, then in this case, we're speaking back to the shepherds. We're talking to them. Hey, shepherds, so like across, we're using our imaginations across time, right, to say to these shepherds 2,000 years ago, why are you so happy? Why are you singing? Why your joyous strains prolong? What the gladsome tidings be? In other words, what's the good news? Tidings are news. So what are, what are these, what's this really happy news you're talking about which inspire your heavenly songs? So you're singing, you're saying the same things the angels were. Why? And so now the glory and excelsis Deo, almost like, you know how it knows how country songs do? Like every verse, every chorus, the chorus changes its meaning a little bit every time you get back to it and it tells the story. Well, this kind of does the same thing. Every time we sing glory and excelsis Deo, it takes on a slightly different context. Because now we're asking the angels, why are you, sorry, the shepherds, why are you singing the same thing the angels were? Right? So, now, in the first verse, was it you and I or was it the shepherds? I'm not sure. If it's the shepherds, then there's a dialogue going on here, right? They tell us, hey, hey, singers in the 21st century, we heard angels singing and, and we heard the mountains echoing in Excelsis Deo. And then we say back to them, well, why? You know, what are you, so ha what are you singing about? Why are you singing, shepherds, glory in Excelsis Deo? Well, let's look at the third verse. Come to Bethlehem and see... Him whose birth the angels sing, come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn king. Now again, my question is, who's the speaker? If we're having an imaginary dialogue with, with the shepherds, then we've just said to the shepherds, hey shepherds, why are you singing? Why are you so happy? And they're answering us here. 
And the shepherds are saying to you and I in the 21st century, well, come to Bethlehem. So use your imaginations, right? Come across time and space and come to Bethlehem. We heard the angels singing about Jesus. So you come worship with us. Come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn king. So we, the shepherds, have gone to worship Jesus. We want you to join us. And you, 21st century worshipers, you come join us in singing Gloria and Excelsis Deo. Or another possibility is the speaker here is you and I. And we're just saying to everybody, hey, everybody, come to Bethlehem and see what the shepherds have seen. Hey, everybody, come and worship with us on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn king. Now, notice this is all called a worship. This is an invitation either to you and I or to everybody all around, to come and to worship Jesus. And so as we invite humanity, as we invite 21st century humanity or whoever it is that happens to be singing this song, now glory and excelsis Deo takes on a slightly different meaning. Now it's not just the angels, it's not just the shepherds, but everybody is being invited to come and to worship Jesus. Now let's look at the fourth verse. See him in a manger laid, Jesus, Lord of heaven and earth. Mary, Joseph, lend your aid. With us sing our Savior's birth. Now, who's speaking now? This is possibly us, right? As the worshipers of Jesus, we're, we're imagining being there in, uh, at the stable or in front of the manger. And we're there and, we're, and we are saying to one another, hey, look at this, right? Or perhaps it's the shepherd speaking again to us, to worshipers. See him in a manger laid, Jesus, Lord of heaven and earth. But notice again, there's a call to worship. Mary, Joseph, lend your aid. So the angels have worshipped, right? The mountains have worshipped. Humanity is being invited to worship. And there is the shepherds kneel worshiping Jesus as you and I uh, in our imaginations are there, worship, are there worshiping Jesus. Mary and Joseph are invited to join, which I think is really, really cool. That's not something I'd really noticed before, but here's what we're saying. Nobody's left out. Like, we're all supposed to worship Jesus. Mary and Joseph, you guys are super important, and we appreciate what you did, but you need to worship too, because you also need a Savior. And so every available voice, like every one of us, nobody gets left out. We're all going to sing, and with us sing our Savior's birth. So now we have Mary and Joseph included you know, there in the stable as we sing for the last time in the song, Glory to God in the Highest. So each time voices, each time you get to glory to God in the highest, voices are added to this. What I've discovered about this song is that it's really about worship. I mean, what, uh, what uh, has happened here, and I really appreciate it, so thank you, Mr. Chadwick, is he wrote my sermon outline for me. It's really great. Because what he did is he took me through the Luke chapter 2. He took me through Luke chapter 2 from a different perspective and gave me a sermon outline. So, I mean, this is awesome. Uh, because every year, right, we get to this time of year and I think, okay, Luke chapter 2 again. And it's awesome. Luke chapter 2 is great. But we've heard it a lot, right? So what's the different perspective? What can we get? Well, this is a perspective I have not seen before which is, let's look at Luke chapter 2 as a call to worship. And so thank you, Mr. Chadwick, for my sermon outline. Uh, so we're going to look at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, and then we'll, we'll dig into depth where the song picks up. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And then we keep going to verse 2. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Now, quick little Christmas trivia. It's not Bethlehem. It's Bethlehem. Bet means house in Hebrew, and lahem means bread. So, house of bread. Go to the city of David, which is where David was born and where he was from, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And by the way, I want to tell you something more literally. Uh, the Greek says the days were accomplished. The implication is that they were actually there for quite a while. We don't know if it was several days or several weeks or even a couple of months, but the implication here is this is not the night they showed up. 
Okay, so while they were there, it came time. The days were accomplished. It was time for her to give birth. So they'd probably been there a while. Verse 7, And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger. Now, swaddling cloths are normal. If you've had a baby, you understand this, right? Babies come out of their mother's womb, and it's, woo, it's weird to have your arms and legs all ah, in the cold air. And so it really helps to swaddle newborn babies, right? It's really important. It's one of the first things I learned as a dad, and it was, I was really good at it. I just wrapped him up like a little burrito. Just, you know, it's, re, it's super important. And so she, she wraps him up to keep him warm, and she lays him in a manger because there's no place for them in the guest room. Uh, the word translated in here elsewhere when it's used in the New Testament mean, is used to mean a place or a guest room. It's the same word that's used when Jesus reserves the upper room for uh, his disciples. So this is not necessarily talking about a hotel. Okay, this is not the Motel 6 or whatever. Uh, it means somewhere, a room or a space, where people were um, staying. And this does not necessarily mean that there wasn't a place for them to sleep. The Bible also applies pretty strongly. They've been there a while. Probably this means there was no place for them in the guest room to have a baby because there were other people there. And so she lays him in a manger, so there are animals present. Now, we don't know necessarily that it was a stable or a cave. All we know is where the animals were kept. In those days, a lot of times people would just build a little extra shelter on the back of their house or below their house and keep their animals there. So they might be just right out back. Um, so this is what happens. So she gives birth and she lays him there. So here Jesus is born in very, very humble circumstances. Now, what I want you to imagine is that the animals are surrounding them. Like there are animals there. Now, I don't know how many of them Joseph shoot out, and it's like, get away, you can't eat under the baby, you know, and he, but as I'm talking about that, I want to tell you something that this song, I think, shows us. Imagination is a good thing. I'm waiting for the amen. It's okay. Imagination is a good thing, because like every, now, a lot of times we think imagination, we think of it as bad. Because it has been misused, and, it's, and it gets misused, and you and I misuse it. But every gift is from God. And when it's good, when it's used for a good purpose, yeah, imagination is a gift. Imagination is how you solve problems, right? Imagination is how you take little mini vacations when things are really stressful, right? I'm on the beach right now, right? And, Im and imaginations also help us to interpret Scripture, not only here, but in our hearts. And so we can use our imaginations that God has given us to imagine what it was like for Mary and Joseph at that time. And it helps us to appreciate what God has done for us. And so this song is inviting us to use our imaginations and to transport ourselves through time and space and imagine us being with the angels and the shepherds and Mary and Joseph and worshiping Jesus. And so use your imaginations. Imagine being there. And here's the first thing that we see in Mr. Chadwick's sermon outline. And again, thank you, sir. Um, number one, the angels worship. Look at verse 8. So this is our first sermon point, the angels worship. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, shepherds are uh, kind of really great because this is the ordinary Joe of ordinary Joes. I mean, this is, this is normal, average people. These are regular folks. And what's really cool is that they're out there probably in the same fields where David was. So, city of David, David was a shepherd, they're out there, same place, which is really neat. Also, the, the, word, the term or, and the concept of shepherding is all the way through Scripture. When, when God tells David a thousand years prior to this, hey, there's going to be a descendant from you who's going to reign over my people forever and be their savior, and this is going to be the anointed one, which is what the word Messiah means when he tells David there's going to be one like you but greater than you that's going to come from you and rule over my people forever he says they're going to this person is going to shepherd my people and so as a king in a figurative sense as a shepherd of the people the messiah is going to be a shepherd and the, and Jesus himself says that about himself he says i am the good shepherd and then ministers of the gospel 
Here's the word, pastors. I thought, you know what that word means, right? It means shepherd. <laughs> and so uh, Peter says to the elders in the church, he says, be pastors, be shepherds of your people. And so this is a great picture of ordinary people being told a message, right? And then getting to go and be shepherds of people, to go and be messengers. And so there they are at night. Now, we don't know what time of year it really was, um, but some people speculate it was springtime because they're out at night, but the winters in that area are pretty mild, so it really could be any time of year. Um, then we get to verse 9. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. Probably they weren't afraid of the angels so much, though just suddenly somebody suddenly appearing is kind of shocking. But the idea here is they're filled with great fear because of the glory of God. <gasps> and this is what happens when the glory of God appears to people. Because he is so much, he is so glorious, he is more than we can handle. And so they are terrified. And so angels all the time, when they're having to show up, they always have to start with this phrase. Look at verse 10. And the angel said to them, fear not. All the time they're having to say that. <laughs> so like the very first thing, don't be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news. Uh, in the Greek word that, um, that Luke uses here is the word from which we get evangelism. right? So I bring you euangelion, the good news or message, right? Angelos means messenger. Angel means messenger. Here's a good message. I bring you a good message of great joy. That Don't worry. The thing I'm about to tell you is actually happy news, right? I'm not bringing judgment news. I'm bringing super good news of great joy that's not just for you. It's for everybody, which is really cool because God is demonstrating it to everybody by giving the news to shepherds, Right? And the implication here is you're going to have to tell people. Like, you're going to want to tell people. But this is for everybody. This isn't just for you guys. This is for everyone. So here's the good news. We look at verse 11. And the, for unto you is born this day, so it's just happened, like right now, in the city of David, which if they knew their scriptures, they knew that's what the Bible said would happen. The Messiah would be born in the same, the anointed one like David, but descended from David, but greater than David would be born in David's town. In the city of David, where you are right now, a Savior, who is Christ. Now, the Greek term is Christ. The, from the Hebrew, the term is Messiah. It means anointed one. The one like David who was anointed with oil and anointed with the Holy Spirit. There is going to be one greater than David. The, the anointed one. Christ, the Lord, the boss, the chief, the king over king that you've been waiting for. It happened. Thousand years you've been waiting. It's right now. Now look at verse 12. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Now, I've always kind of wondered, why do they mention as part of the sign the swaddling cloths? I mean, isn't that kind of obvious? I mean, that's what you do with newborn babies. I already mentioned that. Here's my theory. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. You can, you can tell me your own theories after the sermon. Tell me what you think. But I think part of the reason for the sign here is... <laughs> It's so, the ba it's so the shepherds don't get confused between a newborn baby and a bigger baby. <laughs> you know, like, look, if you, just because you find a baby doesn't mean that's the one, you need to be looking for a newborn. All right, so here you go, guys, in swaddling cloths. So that's, that's just my theory. So you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, so a newborn baby, and lying in a manger. Now, that's weird, right? That doesn't happen. So that's how you'll know that what we're telling you is true, that, this, that the baby that is born today, the Savior, you'll know we're right because babies don't get put in mangers every day. That's weird. So you'll know we're telling the truth. The implication is the angels are saying, go find out, shepherds. Like, go see. Like, we want you to know. this. It's no point in them telling them about the sign if they don't go see it for themselves. Like, we want you to experience this. And then the one angel is saying it, and he gets joined by others. Look at verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts. And this does not necessarily mean they were playing in the, floating in the sky. They could have been. Or they could have been standing on the ground. We don't know. But they're from the heavens. 
Uh, and they are the host, which means an army of angels, praising God and saying, look at verse 14. If we were to say this in Latin, we would say Gloria in excelsis Deo. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. In other words, the peace isn't going to happen for everyone. It's going to happen for those who put their trust in him. Now, the message is for all, but not all are going to have peace with God, only those who have a relationship with Jesus. And, of course, we find out more about that as Jesus grows older and we see his ministry. But there is going to be peace right, for those who are God's people, who become his people through Jesus. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased or upon those whom his favor rests. Glory to God in the highest. And so, first sermon point, angels worship God. Look at the verse of the song. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. Gloria and excelsis Deo. This is what angels do. Like, they praise God. We Angels worship God. God created these beings, and they worship him. Look at uh, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. And one called to another, these heavenly beings, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the angel armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. So notice this theme, heaven and earth. So the heavenly beings are praising God in the mountains. The earth is echoing back their joyous strains. And here the angels are crying out, God is holy, holy, holy. And all of the earth, not just the heavens, but the earth, all of creation is full of his glory. This is what angels do. Look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 11. From before creation to after the, the end of all things. They just keep going. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands. What are they doing? Verse 12, they're saying with a loud voice, worthy. And here they're praising Jesus. Worthy, with the same, the angels who praise God, praise Jesus. Because he is God. This is significant that he's being worshipped by angels. That Jesus, this is not a simple human person that's chosen by God to do cool stuff. There's lots of people like that in the Bible. David and Moses and Paul, Peter. You can name lots of them. They don't receive the same worship. They don't receive worship from the angels like Jesus does because he is God. This is significant. Worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. They are worshiping. They are giving worth to Jesus. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable, innumerable angels and festal gatherings. So you, as Christians, you are coming to the heavenly city, and you're going to join in what the angels are already doing. Look at verse 23. And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, to Christians, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus. We're joining all of them. Look at verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So, just a lot here. Okay, I'm just going to point out two things. Number one, we don't just we don't worship baby Jesus. We worship Lord Jesus, who grew up and died on the cross and rose from the dead and reigns forever. And so we can't just stop at the baby. Jesus is Jesus and glorious, not simply because he was born, that's just part of the story, but because of what he accomplished for us from the cross, the mediator of the new covenant. And we join, when we go to heaven, we join with the worship that's already happening. 
And so the angels worship. Second sermon point, and thank you again, Mr. Chadwick, for giving us this in our second verse. The shepherds worship. The angels worship in Luke chapter 2, and the shepherds worship. Let's look at what happens in verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So God has sent his messengers to us. They told us there was a sign. Let's go check it out. So they say that to one another. Let's go see. Right? Verse 16. And so they went in, went with haste. Right? So they run. to poor sheep. <laughs> Buy sheep. Right? To leave the sheep and they run. And they find Mary and Joseph. Now, again, use your sanctified imaginations and picture this. Right? I think this is hilarious. They're not told which manger. <laughs> like, this is so funny. And so they're like running in people's backyards. And, you know, in the, on the back end of the house, there's a little uh, shelter, is just, which is how it was normally done. And they look and there's, you know, a donkey and a couple sheep and things grazing. And they look, nope, not in this manger. Not one over here either. You know, and they keep, they're running all over town. You, want, you think people may be starting to wake up? <laughs> like, why are there shepherds in our backyard? And, you know, eventually a shepherd's got a reputation of walking off with sheep, you know. So are people getting nervous, like, hey, why are you guys around our sheep? What's going on? So they have to go and find Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger, which they do. Don't know how long it took, but they had to go actually do this, right? So then we get to verse 17. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. So in verse 17, this is what we see here. Who did they tell? Well, initially, they're telling Mary and Joseph. That's who they're telling. And maybe anybody else who might have been present. Because it's possible that Joseph had some assistance. It's not mentioned in the story, but the lady of the house or a midwife or a couple people might have been around. But everybody who's right there, they tell them. So the implication here is not just Mary and Joseph, but it's first Mary and Joseph. They said, guess what has happened to us? Like, like can you imagine Mary? She's there with her baby and, oh, wow, you know, swine clothes, manger, and man, I can't believe this is happening. And all of a sudden, these shepherds show up. It's like, so for those of you who have been in the hospital, you don't have to raise your hands. Some of you like visitors, right? You're like, yeah, come see me at the hospital. I'm bored and I'm lonely and I would love for you to come see me. Others are like, I don't want to see anybody. <laughs> I don't want anybody to see me like this, and I don't want to see them stay away, right? You don't have to admit which one you are, right? But I just want you to use your imaginations here. Mary and Joseph don't get much of a choice. Visitors show up, strangers, people they don't know. And these strangers come with a message. Hey, guess what? We just saw angels, and guess what the angels told us? They sang glory to God in the highest, and they said, This baby is the Savior, is Christ the Lord, and we've been waiting for it. And Mary and Joseph go, oh, yeah, that's what we've been told by angels too. And so is confirmation. And look at verse 18. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. And so the all implies it's not just Mary and Joseph, but there are other people, right? And they keep going. Look at verse 20. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So as they go back through the town, now I'm assuming, the Bible doesn't tell us how, I'm assuming people woke up. Right? I'm assuming that the shepherds made some noise, disturbed some people. You know, you can imagine it was like, honey, I'm hearing voices in the backyard. Go find out what's going on. I mean, people get up and they go, and we don't know this is literally during sleeping time, but we can assume that some people were asleep. But they go out there and they hear the message. Shepherds are worshiping and they're being missionaries. The very first missionaries about Jesus specifically are these shepherds. They're sharing the good news. They are evangelizing and they're telling other people. And then we get to verse 19. But Mary treasured all these th up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And in verse 20, and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. So we get to verse 2 of the song. Hey shepherds, why this jubilee? Why your joyous strains prolong? What the gladsome tidings be? Why are you telling this? So maybe it's the townspeople speaking when we sing verse 2. Hey, shepherds, what are you so happy about? Which inspire your heavenly songs. And the shepherds answer, glory to God in the highest. And so angels worship and shepherds worship. And the third sermon point is this. We all should worship. 
This is what happens with the shepherds. Verse 17 tells us that when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. So people heard this. What are they going to do? Are they going to worship? And what about Mary? But Mary Verse 19, treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. God is not a God of isolation. He was in, before time and space, he was in perfect community and relationship. The Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God was not lonely. But when he created us in his image, he created us like him with a need for community. God is not a God of isolation. And so as Jesus is born at night, and, and I know that a lot of our picture is very, very private, right? We imagine, we imagine this very private thing where it's just Mary and it's just Joseph and it's just a baby. But guess what? Not for long. The angels show up. All of creation starts praising God. The earth that, that this baby made, right, is praising him. The animals standing around him, right, are subservient to him. From the bottom and lowliest creature of animals, all the way to the highest creature that he made, from the lowest to animals to the highest, which, which would be angels and then human beings. Every creature, heaven and earth, middle of the earth, all of us giving praise to Jesus. Everybody. It's, it's a Mar does Mary worship privately? Yes, she does. She ponders them in these things in her heart. But also, there is worship in community. And this is not really a choice. Like if we're all called to do this, it's a command. Look at Psalm 100 verses 1 and 2. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Right? All of the earth, like all of creation, you make a joyful noise to the Lord. You praise him. Right? And everybody on the earth, animals, people, everybody. Look at verse 2, Psalm 100. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. This is what we're supposed to do. We, we are supposed to worship. Now, you and I were designed for worship. There's a reason why he what heaven is, is worshiping God forever. And there are people who, and I had this question when I was a teenager. Boy, that sounds boring. It's not. And let me explain why it's not boring. You and I were designed and created for worship. And even when human beings worship idols, we prove we are created for worship. Because we're going to worship. Human beings are going to worship. You can't stop them. Because that's how God made them. Now, they may not be worshiping the right thing, but they're going to worship. And so as you think about the ancient idols of every peoples, of every nation ever that worshiped, that worshiped something, right? Or if you think of our modern day idols, whatever those things might be, and you know you're, there's some stuff drifting through your minds, you know, fame and success and cars and whatever. Uh, what do we do with those things? We worship them. We give them our attention. We give them our praise. We give them our songs. You know, we, you know, what are, what are songs about on the radio, right? Sometimes a song is about partying because people worship that. Sometimes the songs are about romantic love because people worship that. Whatever they're about, it just demonstrates what people worship. We're designed for that. We want to worship. Worship is fun. It's good. Now imagine worshiping the one true object of our worship, the one who deserves it. And it is joyous. And so we should encourage others to worship. This is the fourth sermon point and what the fourth verse of the song is actually about. This is what, um, what he says. We should encourage others to worship. And the last verse is this. See him in a manger laid, Jesus, Lord of heaven and earth. Mary, Joseph, lend your aid. With us sing our Savior's birth. What's happening here, and I think this is kind of fun, is that you and I are encouraging Mary and Joseph to join us. Like, hey, Mary and Joseph. It's like, Mary, I know you got your thoughts, and that's cool. That's good. 
you need to open your mouth and sing now. Like, we want you to, to, to join us. Like, this is what we're supposed to do. It's not just that the angels worship, right, which we've seen. It's not just that the shepherds worshiped. But all of us are supposed to worship. And we're supposed to encourage other people to worship. So in this song, we're encouraging Mary and Joseph to worship. But you and I are supposed to encourage others to worship. That's what missions is. The reason we go and we tell people about Jesus is so that more people will worship Jesus. It's ultimately what missions is all about. Because we have been created to give worth to God and telling other people about Jesus that they might be saved from their sins and they might also praise Jesus is adding worshipers. It's ultimately about worship. So the angels worship, right? And creation worships. So look at what Jesus tells us to do. When his disciples said, hey, Jesus, teach us to pray. Here's how he said to pray. Maybe you remember this line from Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Now, you know the line about forgive us as we have forgiven others, which means I'm not just praying this, God, but there's something I have to do. I mean, you can't really pray, forgive us of our sins as we have forgiven others if you're not forgiving other people. And so in this prayer, there's a call to action. There's something you're having to do while you're praying. And so do you remember this one? Lord, we ask that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. You can't really pray that if you're not also willing to do it. And God's will in heaven is that everyone in heaven praises Jesus. And that's, in fact, what's happening. And so part of what it means to pray this prayer for us to do God's will on earth as it is in heaven is to praise Jesus. In heaven, Jesus is worshipped by the angels and by all of those who are already there. The Father is worshipped by the angels and those who are already there, and we should do the same. This story, this baby Jesus, we're invited in our imaginations to go and to worship him, but not just the birth. Jesus grows up. He goes to the cross. He rises from the dead, and one day will return in glory, and you and I will join the angels. We will join all of creation. We will join the saints from over millennia in worship of Jesus. But we don't have to wait, right? We can start now. Please join us as we stand together.